So welcome again. We're glad you're here to who in, in Who Am I? <clears throat> what a disaster start. Probably it'll get better. Uh, asking and answering some of life's most basic foundational questions. And it, it did start slowly, but I really do think, especially kind of starting last week, we've really gotten to some very, very helpful and important important places because there's some of these questions that we kind of maybe just assume or skip over or you think you know the answer but then you're not sure why is that even the answer like does that even make sense could I defend that like w- w- is there even sense to be made and where do you even start so what we've been doing is trying to start at the beginning which is reputed to be a very good place to start and so we started very simply but a little bit profoundly with this is you are a creature created by a creator and what that means Means. One of the things that means, of course, is that it's not the creation that defines itself. It's not, I don't have to decide who I am. I don't have to have another creature tell me who I am. We find our answers where they can be found, which is in the creator. It's always the creator who defines the creation. And so we look to God for answers. And so, all right, that's a good place to start. Then if you were here week two, we went another step and we said, you are a spiritual creature created in the image of the creator God, currently with a physical human body, which is not you. You are the spiritual creature created in the image of God. And so that was interesting and helpful and took another step. And then last week, if you were here or if you weren't, especially if you weren't here last week, I hate saying things like this because they sound so much, they at least feel to me like being very like self-promotional, but it was really good. It was really good. Go back if you weren't here. Watch the, the uh, either on the message tab on lifepointcrossing.com or the YouTube page is LPX, as in Life Point Crossing Live. LPX Live is our YouTube channel. And go watch that. I feel like it was one of the most helpful and profound things uh, that I've maybe said ever. And it was really, what's the core of who you are? What really makes you you? What is the point, or excuse me, what is the piece that drives and defines all the other pieces. And it's that you are a spiritual creature created in the image of God who has become a righteous adopted child of God through Jesus Christ. There was a lot more to it than that, but that's where it ended. And I felt like that was really good. So today we're continuing, but we're going a little bit in a different sort of sideways direction with a related question is, okay, well, so what am I worth? Right? Do I have value? And again, the very, very important, closely related question, how would I know? How do I know? When I was a kid, I loved cards, baseball cards, football cards, and I loved them just because I loved them. But I got a little older and I realized that an element was added when it became known to me that they had value. And this was fantastic for a couple of reasons. And one of them is that there was a printed, published price guide that came out every month that told my friends and me exactly what any card was worth. What's this worth? I'll show you. It's worth exactly this much. And we had objective data. It was really good. It was really helpful. Now, my dad was very unimpressed with the price guide. He would say very, very buzzkill things like, it's worth what someone's going to give you for it. Because he clearly did not understand the authority of the price guide. And the other thing that was great about the price guide is that it told us that the most undesirable cards there were, they were called commons, just cards that weren't particularly notable players, they were worth five cents each. And if you're quick on your math, at the time you would get a pack of 12 for 50 cents. That meant if you got no good cards at all, if you got the worst cards you could possibly get, and you would always have at least one or two or three good cards, but even if you got no good cards, immediately your 50 cent investment was worth 60 cents. Now, I was young, I didn't understand investments and rate of return, anything like that, but this was fantastic. This should be everybody's first and greatest investment, and so this was really wonderful. A few years later, I decided that it was time to liquidate my investments. And by that time, I was a little older and I knew that, all right, these common cards, if I have a thousand of them, math says that should be worth $50, but nobody's going to give me endless nickels for the cards that really nobody wants. I knew nobody wanted those, but I did have some really good cards. And so I took some of those, the best ones, to the card shop in the mall in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I I laid down the first one, the best one on the counter. And the guy looked down at it and looked up and he said, 
yeah, we, we really are only interested in cards that are mint, meaning perfect condition. My cards were not in perfect condition. And so he literally did not even make me an offer. And he was a person who bought cards. I was so excited. This was early 90s. I thought if things went well, I was going to walk out with enough money to go buy a computer. Instead, I walked out with my tail between my legs, didn't even have a tail, but, and, and the newfound knowledge that my most prized possessions were not prized at all. They were really worth not much. My dad was right. Something's worth what someone's going to give for it. How about art? I don't get art, at least in a lot of ways. I don't get art. But some people do. Some people really enjoy art. Some people pay a lot of money for art. I don't know if anybody recognizes this, but this is a piece that's called the Interchange. I'm not sure if I have it in the right direction or if there even is a right direction. See, and that's funny. It's not a joke, but it is funny. Uh, this most recently sold for $300 million. I just said I don't get art. I do not see the value in this piece. If I was acquiring art for my own enjoyment, I would not pay $1 for this. I would not take it for free. That would just mean that now I had to get rid of it. It would have literally negative value to me. I consider myself richer for not having it than I would if I had it. It's worth $300 million. I actually looked up an article on why it would be considered so valuable. I do not understand art. The wordplay is not intentional, but I, I did understand the article. I understood all of the points that it made, and it, all, I, it was comprehended, but it even acknowledged it basically boiled down to, here's why, is people like it. I guess somebody liked it a lot. So how about you? What are you worth? Okay. And how do you know? Well, of course, we're all familiar with the idea and the concept, the, the phrase of net worth. And uh, with the number of people in this room, there's probably a, a pretty good spread in terms of net worth. Probably some people with a pretty significant net worth. Probably some people with a, a whole lot less. That's interesting. There, there may even be, you know, I think of someone like our son Charles. He's a senior in college. He doesn't have a lot of school debt like some people, but he doesn't have a dollar to his name and is actually literally negative net worth. In fact, randomly this week, he owes me a couple hundred dollars. Well, I'll tell you what, though. Laura and I, we value him at very, very positively. I read an article on how the government sort of would be considered to value people in terms of, this could sound maybe a little bit crude, but just a reflection of the fact that the world has limited resources and if we spend all of our resources in solving one problem or making one thing safe, then other people suffer and die for, for something else. And so just as a way to sort of quantify it, the article came to the conclusion that our government values a human life at right around $10 million. Now, some of you think, that's terrible. How could you ever put a dollar value on a human life? Some others of us maybe think, okay, well, you know, compared to my net worth, that's a real boost. Charles might hear that and say, well, shoot, I, I just went from literally negative net worth to $10 million. This is fantastic. How about the painting, though? Think about this. If, the, if we're $10 million and the painting's $300 million, if there's 29 of us together in a room, we're worth altogether a little bit less than that painting. Now, if some more people come in, if we can get to 30, then now we're about even. That seems strange to me. Does that seem strange maybe to anybody else? So what are you worth? And how do you know? If I'm a baseball card, honestly, I'm a common I'm not super well-known or super accomplished. I remember quite a few years ago, I was talking with a guy who I was with at church, and he's like, wouldn't it be fun if they made, like, pastor cards, you know, like baseball cards? It'd be like, whoa, I got a Craig Rochelle. Like, oh, Kenneth Copeland. Like, hey, leave, let's go. You know, like, whoever, whatever you like or don't like. If, if I had a pastor card, it, they could turn over the back and the stats on the back, like, here's, you know, attendance or baptisms or whatever. It's not, not really that remarkable. And in terms of condition, 
I'm not in perfect condition either. I'm 47 years old. I have some wrinkles and some scars, certainly emotionally and spiritually. Nobody makes it too long in this world without getting your corners bent up a little bit. I'm not. None of us are really in perfect condition. About art? Well, Again, I, I said I don't really understand art. Maybe I could take an art appreciation class or somebody could explain to me how some paintings are better or more valuable than others. But if that interchange, if that was worth $300 million and the reason really boils down to people like it, that seems very arbitrary to me. So now, am I just at the whims of likes and dislikes and... I don't know, like, like there's some people who like me a lot. My mom is a big fan. She comes right to mind. There are other people who don't like me a whole lot whose opinion matters. Does anybody's opinion matter? What about my own self? I grew up in the 80s. We heard a lot, if you remember the 80s, about things like self-esteem. It was really important to, to think positively about yourself. But why does that matter either? And is there anything more obnoxious than someone who's a little overly self-important and thinks of themselves maybe a little more highly than it seems like they should. Well, again, again, this is why we started where we started. You're a creature created by a creator. And so we go for answers, not to ourselves as a creature or another person or society, which are other creatures, but to God. What, is, what does God say? And so there was actually a pretty good hint week two on the week where we talked about being created in the image of God. There was a pretty good, pretty good hint there that human beings are created specifically and uniquely distinct from the rest of creation. And there were even some pretty good hints that human beings have unique value to God, which is interesting because really you think uh, he could just flick us, just be done, create somebody new or a completely new species or whatever he wants to do, but here is what in fact happened. Is our creator God has decided, which is a little bit of a strange word, but we're trying to use words to talk about God, so that's as well as I could do, but decided to love us and to value us. As God of the universe, There is no one and no thing that would compel him to do so. But he decided, theologically we would say before he even created, that human beings would have unique, distinct value to him. And so that sounds maybe very encouraging, that's maybe very interesting, but where does it it go? Where, Where does that lead? What does it end up with? Well, you know what something's worth? What someone will pay for it. You've probably come across this before. God loved the world, by which he just means humanity, people, you, so much that he gave, what did he give? His one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him, that's you, will not perish, but have eternal life. And living on this side of history, living on the the A.D. years, this isn't even theoretical or hypothetical. This has happened. Past tense. This is, God has demonstrated this. If you've been here, you've seen this. This is my favorite sentence in history. Romans 5, 8. But God, look, he showed. It's past tense. He showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Here's what God has for you is great love. And here's how he values you is by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This is exactly what you're worth to God. And this is how you know. Just a Quick sampling of, I'm going to put these on the screen, but a quick sampling of other places in Scripture where it says effectively the same thing. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, God bought you with a high price. Colossians 1.13 and 14 says, He purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. 1 Timothy 2.6 says, Jesus gave his life to purchase 
freedom. And it's, it's not based in what anybody likes or doesn't like or somebody's opinion or a market that might go up or down or what if my, continu- my condition deteriorates. This is the decision made by the eternal God who created the universe. He is the authoritative standard by which all else is mentioned. It is his voice that matters and there are no others. And this is the conclusion, that God loves you and values you so highly that he sent Jesus to die so you could be reconciled to him. And let's not get past this verse before we also take specific note of the last five words here. He did this while we were still sinners. Two verses later, he actually uses a different, some different words to sort of represent the same thing. He says, while you were still his enemies, which was actually directly alluded to in one of the songs this morning. And th- that would seem like a really strange time to pay the high price, right? Like human beings, we wouldn't really be prone to do something like that. Not, certainly not at a time like that. Why would we pay a high price for something that was still sinful or, or our enemies or very, very damaged? But human beings, we tend to appraise value but with a, a couple different things. One, of course, is production. We will value things based on what they can do for us. My car has value to me so long as it can provide transportation. My fridge has value to me so long as it keeps my food cold. We also very often, in ways that are you know, not even always inappropriate, but we sometimes value people less on who and what they are and more on what they can do for us. What I mean is that you value Patrick Mahomes over the 8 billion people on the planet who you don't even know their names because he provides wins for your football team. If he stops doing that, you'll value him a little bit less and a little bit closer to the other 8 billion people who you don't even know, right? And, and because that's just how we think as humans. And so it's very easy for us to then project this mindset on God and then see ourselves from his perspective through that lens. It is absolutely inaccurate. Here is as clearly as can be is how God values you. While we were still sinners, so highly that Jesus comes and dies. And, and so some of us, I know if, if we're thinking through a sort of human lens, we think, well, maybe, you know, I, I'm not really worth that much. I don't really produce that much. I don't even really know how great my capacity is. The more I think about it, a lot of what I do is actually wrong and sinful. I might be, in fact, more work to God than I'm, than, than, than I'm really worth. As clearly as can be, I just referenced five different places in Scripture where it says very clearly, here's how God values us, listen, while we were still sinners. And of course, chronologically that happened before we were alive, but the point is that you didn't have to be good or produce something for God to love and value you. This is another message for another day, a little bit, but we tend to get this so backwards. We don't live in a certain way so that God will love us. We live in a certain way because God loves us. We don't have to act a certain way or behave in a certain way or produce certain things so that God will love and value you. God loves and values you. And so our response to him is to live the life that he has for us. Of course, the other thing we tend to do um, factor in with value is condition. And just sort of talked about with the baseball cards, like we're all not in mint condition We all have some bent up corners. Really, probably every one of us has also been a part of kind of dinging up somebody else's corners at some point in life, whether you meant to or not. Probably both, really, if you're over about eight years old. But here's we're human beings. This is is what happens. This is the fallen world. But here's the key is it's the exact same. The message is the exact same. Your value is not determined by your condition. Because God loves us and chose to love us while we were still his enemies and sinners. In other words, in your worst condition. There's a lot made out of this, but I think for very good reason. In fact, it might be the most remarkable scene in the history of the planet. When Jesus is literally 
hanging, dying on a cross between two convicted criminals who are being executed for things that they have absolutely done wrong. And one of them, in his own simple way, he reaches out in faith to Jesus and asks for his favor. You think about this for a moment, and this is is really remarkable. This might have been, at that moment, the only person on the planet who believed in Jesus. Because it sure looks like this is the end for him and his little movement. It's all going to go away. And also, could there have possibly been a more worthless follower? What's this guy going to do for you? I mean, his sinfulness and his behavior is well established. He himself acknowledges that he deserves to be executed for his crimes. He's not going to be able to like go anywhere and do something. He's literally nailed to a cross. He's, what's his condition? Literally in the process of expiration. But his value is not in what he can produce or what his condition is. His value is that he is a, creator, a creature created in the image of of God, and therefore God values him tremendously. He reaches out to Jesus, and Jesus receives him. A little bit of a sidebar, but I think worth mentioning and talking about, is aside from a biblically informed view of the world and life and reality, it becomes maybe very difficult at best to legitimately catastrophic at worst to even try to ask or answer some of these questions in terms of why do I have value or do, do I have value? What is my worth and how would I know? I know there are people who posit uh, answers to these sorts of things, but I think it becomes incredibly difficult to like, where, where do you even start? Like, a value to what or to whom? A value to the rest of society? Like I, I maybe people who produce more than they consume are of positive value and people who consume more than they produce are kind of of negative value. In fact, maybe people who end up consuming more than they produce, maybe we're kind of better off without them. And that's exactly been the philosophy behind the darkest moments And the darkest things that have happened in human history, which even most atheists will be very, very quick to say, well, no, no, okay, well, not not, not that. We're not not suggesting that, right? Nazism was generally based in the idea of weeding out the weaker and the undesirable. Stalin's millions of murders were based in atheistic philosophy. Well, certainly, even most Darwinists and and atheists will immediately say, no, 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 okay, okay, I'm not saying we should do that. No, we, we all know that's wrong. And so, good, we're all together on that. That's really good. But boy, it becomes really difficult to justify that or or to to answer the question of why. Why is that not good? From a strictly evolutionary perspective, a creature's value is really in its ability to reproduce. The species that are able to thrive are the ones who are most effectively able to reproduce before they themselves expire. Well, I would like to think we all can recognize, whether or not we can explain it, we can all recognize that a human being's value is in more than just the reproductive ability. And why does our species matter anyway? What if we all just stopped having babies and we died out in a generation? Would it matter? Would there, would there be anything lost? Uh, you don't even really have to listen much to begin to hear some people who talk about, you know, really we do kind of as a species, we kind of have some negative effects. And, and maybe you hear people talk about, it very much depends on who you listen to, but you, you can hear anybody talk about how there might be some problems with overpopulation or maybe some of the negative effects that the human race has on the world and the, the planet. And I don't know, maybe it would actually be better if there were few of us, right? At least better for the, the planet or life, or whichever ones of us manage to be those fewer ones. But why is there any value to life in the first place? And again, I I know there are people who do try and answer these questions. I don't want to misrepresent anybody and say, well, ah, there's no answer, they're all stupid. But I'll say this much, I've heard some answers, and, and none of them have been even the tiniest bit satisfying or compelling to me. But, viewed through the lens of scripture that God has given us, there is a very good, very solid, very sound answer that we get to very reasonably and very logically. And it's, it's just this simple. We have value because God values us. And he's God. It really still ends up being kind of more about God than about us, honestly. 
but certainly we do present this series in a way that, you know, how does it relate to you? What does this mean to you? And as far as that goes, it's really very meaningful, right? Maybe some of us, maybe we have trouble seeing our value. Maybe we don't feel like we produce a lot or feel like we're in very, very damaged condition. Maybe you've had people tell you that you really don't have any value and just human psychology tells us that whatever you're told enough times, whether it's true or not, we come to believe it. That's just a part of how our minds work. Well, remember that $300 million painting? I still don't get it. If I was at a yard sale, I would walk right past it. If I had it and I was having a yard sale, I would list it for $2. And don't tell anybody, but you could talk me down from that. And so here's what's very tempting for me to do, is say, you know what, I don't get it. I don't see the value in that. It's stupid. Here's what I think it really means. I am terrible at appraising artwork. I don't know. I don't understand. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't know what to look for. I'm really, really a terrible source. I don't, don't bring your artwork to me to see whether or not it's valuable. I don't know. I'm awful at that. Well, if you have trouble seeing the value in yourself, here was your misstep is asking yourself, here's what you need to do is trust the authority. And here's what the authority says is that you have tremendous value, an almost unthinkable level of value, that he loves you and gave the life of Jesus so that you could be reconciled to him. Maybe you don't see that kind of value in yourself, just like I don't see that value in the painting. Okay, you don't even need to. Here's what you need to do. Trust the authority. That's it. Believe that whether it makes sense to you or not, that God values you. And of course, a message like this can't stop until we also extend it to other people. Because here's the key again, is it's, it's the exact same thing. Anybody else's value isn't rooted in how you see them or how you appraise them or what you think of their production or, or condition or anything else might be like. It's based in the fact that God values them as a human being. He's created in their image. So the glamorous CEO, the average middle-class working person, the homeless drug addict, every one of those, a person for whom Christ died. The person who maybe looks different, talks different, thinks different, votes different. The person who maybe even really is fighting against everything that's good and noble in the world. Maybe someone who really hates and is trying to tear down the, the church or the movement of Jesus Christ. Or the person who maybe just really doesn't seem like they have a lot of value in terms of production or condition or whatever it is. Supremely valuable, everyone. The person who looks like they have a ton to offer. Well, that's great. We love that. No problem with that. But their value is not rooted in what they might have to offer. And if their capacity diminishes, their value does not diminish because their value is rooted in how God values them. Your value is rooted in how God values you. And here's the conclusion that you are a spiritual creature created in the image of your creator God who has become a righteous adopted child in the family of God at tremendous cost to him because of his tremendous value on you. These all go together. These all give answers to some of life's biggest, most foundational questions. And you guys, next week, we're going to talk about why. Why did God create me in the first place? Really legitimately, the meaning of life. And guess what? Scripture has a real and clear answer. So you got to come back. Let's pray. Father, thank you that when we can't understand it, can't see it, can't maybe even believe it, that you have chosen to value us. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. And I'm so grateful for 
for that. I'm, I'm grateful that it's not my responsibility to work myself into the favor of the God who created the universe. I'm so grateful that I don't have to bear that burden and that Jesus has done it all for us. Listen, if you're here today still praying, if you've never taken a step to connect to God through Jesus Christ, to become that forgiven adopted child in his family, he has already demonstrated his love and value for you and paid the price. All you need to do is receive it. It's as simple as every one of us knows that we have sinned. We've done things we knew they were wrong. We did them anyway. That destroys the possibility of having a relationship with a perfectly righteous, just God, who as a righteous, just God has to see that wrongdoing is punished. And you have have nothing that you're able to do to make up for that. For how, how can you pay back the creator of the universe? But that's why Jesus, God loved you so much that Jesus came, took that just penalty for you. That was what was happening on the cross. He was absorbing justice for your sin and wrongdoing so that he could take your sinfulness, you would take his sinlessness, his righteousness, and be adopted as a child and his God. That is who he created you to be. If that's you, just right here where you sit, or if you're watching online, you can pray and say it out loud, or even in your heart, just talk to God. He'll hear you say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again so that I could be forgiven and adopted as a child in your family. Well, please come into my life. Forgive me and adopt me. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. And as always, if you pray that prayer or something like that, it's not the words or the prayer that saves you. It's God's grace that comes to you through the faith that you put in the righteousness of Jesus. And you are a new spiritual creation. And maybe it feels different, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. People report all sorts of different experiences, but it's about the reality more than the experience. And that is the reality. Please don't try and do this by yourself. You're not created to do it by yourself. If you would, if you're here, just go out. Let the person at the point know afterwards. That's just the person at the, the corner in the lobby. Give them your information. We'll be able to follow up with you and give, us, give you some good, healthy steps toward the new life that you have in Jesus. If you're online, send us a message and let us know. And we could not be more excited about decisions like this that people make. This is, is why the church is here. And we are so excited about what God and his spirit are doing in your life. Hey, for the rest of us, maybe for some of us, this is really kind of obvious and, and you understood this from long before I ever started talking. For others of us, maybe you see the answers now that you always knew were true and now you just understand the why. For some of us, maybe you never really thought about it, but now you get it. Whatever your, your spot is, will you between yourself and the Spirit of God just right here, right now, commit to putting into practice the implications of whatever this is. Maybe you've had trouble valuing yourself. Maybe you've been somehow overvaluing yourself. Will you value yourself as God values you? Maybe it's other people and maybe there are some other people who you don't value enough. Maybe there's some other people who you tend to overvalue. Whatever it is, will you commit between yourself and the Spirit of God that you will value people based in how God values people because that is the authority and that is what matters and they are worth what God would give for them. Father, we're grateful. We're grateful is such a silly word for what you have done for us and the way you have chosen to value us and to show past tense your value for us. We're grateful and we love you and we offer to you our entire lives in love and in gratefulness and for your glory in the name of Jesus Christ.